Welcome to our online lectures for Chapter 7. This is going to be the first video out of about four that will cover this chapter out of OpenStax College Physics. In this particular video, we're just going to be talking about the first section, Section 7.1, because out of all of the topics in Chapter 7, the one that students tend to struggle with the most once we get into quantitative problems is the term that we call work added for a system. And so we're going to spend some time thinking about work and what that means in a physics context. Because when we use that word in everyday language, we have a lot of different ways that we use it. We can go to work, we can work hard on a project, things like that. But there's a very specific scientific meaning that talks about how energy is transferred within a system. For the textbook, the way that you'll see this written is F times D times cosine of theta. And that works okay as long as you, the student, understands what the textbook thinks theta is supposed to be. Because that is a very specific angle. It's not just if we see an angle in the problem, we throw it in. It has to specifically be the angle between whatever force we're applying and whatever movement we're making. And so the much much better conceptual way to think about it and the way that we can write down when we're plugging in numbers for a quantitative question is that what work is really looking for is the portion of force that is in the direction of motion times the distance that we um, cause that motion. So for example this person who's mowing their lawn is pushing down at an angle only the forward part of the force the sideways part of the force is actually contributing and if we look at how we break that vector into components, the piece of force that is in the direction of motion is the force times the cosine of that angle shown. And so functionally, these two terms or these two ways to think about the work term are the same. But the bottom one, the work is force in the direction of motion times distance, allows us to understand why that cosine term even shows up. In a calculus-based physics course, we would be thinking about work as the dot product between force and um, the displacement. This isn't a calculus um, class, and so that dot product idea is where the cosine comes from. But without that deeper understanding of what angle we're looking for, we can make a lot of mistakes if we rely on the textbook version of that term if we don't understand it. Now, if we want to think about work and the definition of it in words, Work is the mechanical transfer of energy to or from a system by pulling or pushing on it. So I can cause something to speed up or slow down if I push or pull on it. I can give that object energy. And that um, definition works fine as long as we know what energy is. The problem is when we look at our textbook and we try to look up a definition of energy, this, the definition is the ability to do work. And so all of a sudden we're stuck in a cycle if we're trying to rely on these um, word definition of these things. There's another more famous um, textbook that um, goes into a lot of science education throughout that book, but even they have the statement, we'll let the concept of energy expand slowly over the course of several chapters. Great, that's not all that helpful for actually defining what energy is. But that's kind of what we're stuck with. And we've seen this a couple of times this semester when we talked about the definition of time is almost impossible to write down in words, but we all know what time means. We will have a better understanding after going through examples and thinking about what energy types we might have. We will eventually have a better understanding of what we mean by energy, even if we don't have a good written definition for it. Okay, so back to the idea of work. Anytime we introduce a new quantity, we always want to make sure we understand what the units are. So the units of work and of energy in general throughout this chapter are the joule. And we're going to use the letter J to represent that. And it's named after James Prescott Joule, shown here. Um, and a joule is one newton times one meter. So a joule can be written out as newton meters, but we won't ever write that. We'll write joules. And part of the reason for that is newtons are already a combination of our sort of base units. Newtons are just kilograms, meters per second squared. 
And so a joule is even more complicated than that. It's kilograms meters squared per second squared, and we don't want to write all of that out, so we're going to use the unit joule, and we're going to get used to that. There's a note here at the bottom of the slide that eventually we'll be doing some examples where we're thinking about the fact that when we eat food, that food contains energy. Not all of it is going to be directly applied to our ability to do um, pushing and pulling, but some of it will. And so a single joule is a tiny amount of energy when we think about the food that we consume every day. It would take 4,187 joules to equal one food calorie. And it's worth noting that when we talk about food calories like what we see on packages um, here in the US, we write that with a capital C because we don't wanna really understand how much energy we're eating. Most of the rest of the world uses kilocalories, so a lowercase calorie C um, is, you would need a thousand of those lowercase calories to equal one capital C calorie here in the US. So not a big deal. We'll have those unit conversions between joules and food calories um, in our equation sheets when we need them, and we won't be using the idea of kilocalories here, here in this class. Okay, so our first small example, and this is one that I want you to um, read through, think about, and then actually I want you to pause the video and try to do this one on your own. This is like in class if we try to do a problem together and we give us a chance to, to try it on our own. We're gonna do that same kind of thing here. So the equation that we're thinking about is at the top of the slide. And we've got Pete, who's trying to move a box around um, their living room. So Pete is using 150 Newton force, and he's just pushing sideways, to push a 40 kilogram box a distance of two meters. So I want you to pause the video once I finish this sentence and try to write down and calculate how much force, um, how much work rather, how much work that force um, that Pete has, how much work he actually did. So pause the video. So I'm writing it out in case you haven't yet either. You still have a chance even if you didn't pause the video. And so it's 150 Newtons uh, force and all 150 Newtons are in the direction of motion and a two meter distance. And so when we multiply those together, we get 300 and rather than writing Newtons times meters, we're gonna write joules. Okay, so 300 joules is the amount of work that Pete has added to this system by pushing on it. Okay. So hopefully that one was pretty straightforward, but we want to actually continue to think about what we mean by force in the direction of motion. So now Pete has packed these boxes, he's packed his suitcase, and he is using 150 Newton force at an angle of 30 degrees in order to pull a suitcase two meters sideways. So now I want you to figure out how much work that force is doing. So pause the video and try this one on your own. Okay, so the only part of the force that is in the direction of motion is the cosine component of that triangle once we break force into components horizontal and vertical. We want the horizontal piece because we're moving horizontally, sideways. So we would take 150 Newtons times the cosine of 30 degrees and then we would multiply that component of force times the full distance of two meters. We could use the textbook version of the equation and we would get the same result. We would just take 150 times two times the cosine of 30 degrees. But it really is still useful to write the version that we talked about um, at the top of the slide. So our big equation so far that we've done two small quantitative problems, we'll be seeing this in bigger uh, examples soon, can be written in two different ways. The top one here is what the textbook has. The second one here is really how we want to think about it. And so we have another question for us, uh, for ourselves. So this man shown on the slide is holding up a 100 Newton briefcase and he's doing so for uh, 60 seconds. So it's a heavy briefcase. He's holding it, his arm's getting tired. How much work is he doing here? 
So pause the video to think it through. And when you're ready with your answer, and maybe even say it out loud or write it down, but commit to an answer before you unpause the video. Okay, so hopefully right away, and it's fine if not right away, this is a chance for us to, to figure out where our sticking points are. Hopefully what we understood is that although things are happening in this problem and his muscles are getting a workout, he is not doing what we think of in physics as work. He is not transferring any, any energy at all to or from that briefcase. Because no matter what the force is, the distance here is zero meters. And so the amount of work here is zero, no energy. Okay, a second question for us, and now I'm gonna give us some structure. I'm gonna give us a few options available. Now he's gonna carry that 100 Newton briefcase sideways with a constant velocity, and he's gonna walk three meters to the right. So again, I want you to pause the video, think through this, and commit to an answer. Either tell somebody around you, um, write it down, just say it out loud to an empty room, but commit to an answer before you unpause the video. So pause and think through it. Okay. Now hopefully we did not get tricked on this, but if we did, that's totally fine. Just make a note to yourself in your notebook that if you said 300 joules, we are not thinking about that idea of force in the direction of motion properly. We do not want to train ourselves to just throw numbers into an equation and hope that it's right. We don't want to just take 100 times 3 because that's not what that work term is actually asking us about. It's asking about the force in the direction of motion. If we're moving sideways and there is no sideways force, the work here is zero. If we wanted to use the textbook example instead, then we would take 100 newtons times 3 meters but then the angle between those two things is shown here, it's a right angle, 90 degrees. And the cosine of 90 degrees, you can confirm this for yourself in your calculator, the cosine of 90 degrees is zero. So 100 times three times zero still gets us to that answer of zero, option four here. But that concept of what we mean by force in the direction of motion got us there quicker without typing anything to our calculator. And if that's how we were able to answer this one, then we can feel comfortable and on track. And if we weren't, no big deal. It might be worth rewatching this um, in a day or two and making sure that it starts to click quickly. So he wasn't doing any work in the physics sense again, not just holding the briefcase, but also when he was walking sideways. And there's a note here that if you got either of these concept questions wrong, you should make a note to review this topic a little bit extra. Again, there's no penalty for being wrong here. This is when we're first being introduced to the material. But these concept examples help us see if we're on track or not. And so it's worth making a note to yourself in your notebook, full um, capital letters highlight, that this might be something you struggle with if you don't put in that extra effort moving forward. Okay. So another example for us. A friction force here is acting against the motion, because that's what friction force does. We're moving to the right on the slide. Friction is acting to the left. A friction force of six newtons is acting on a block as it slides 1.5 meters, and then it comes to a stop. So find the work done by the friction force. And again, pause the video, think through the options, write stuff down and put it in your calculator if you need to, but figure out what answer you wanna to commit to before we talk through the correct answer. This is the first time, but definitely not the last time, that we will see friction in a problem. And because of the way that friction works in our Physics 125 problems, we're always having friction point opposite the motion. And if we look at those two arrows and actually think about them as arrows, then there is 180 degrees in between those two vectors. So if we are using the textbook um, equation, we would have 6 newtons times 1.5 meters times the cosine of 180 degrees. And you can confirm this in your calculator and maybe write it in your notes, but the cosine of 180 degrees is negative 1. So we would have 6 times 1.5 times negative 1. If we are using the concept of what we mean by work, 
force in the direction of motion, there is negative six newtons worth of force in that direction of motion, the horizontal direction. It's negative because it's opposite the motion, and we can just plug in that minus one there because of the way that friction works. That's going to be true for air resistance too when we start to get to example problems. So negative six times 1.5 will also get us to the same final result. And in both cases, the, our answer here, the work done by the friction force is negative nine joules. That negative work term is telling us that friction is taking energy out of the system. That will make sense to us as we do more examples and talk further in chapter seven, that if we are losing energy, slowing down, that, that's because that energy has to go somewhere. And so in this particular case, there's nothing else happening except we're slowing down because friction is just taking energy out of the system. And the answer here is option three, negative nine joules. So whenever we get negative work, and it'll show up quite often in our example problems, and our quantitative problems, all that means is that energy is being taken out of the system. It doesn't mean we've plugged stuff in wrong. It just means that we have something that is removing energy instead of giving us extra energy, like Pete with the box or with the suitcase. Okay, so for this initial overview, anytime that we struggled with these starter questions, it's just going to be a reminder to us that we might want to rewatch this video in a couple of days time, or at least rewatch it um, at some point, and make sure that it makes more sense the second time around. But that's going to be the end of our very first um, lecture video, and we'll pick back up with the next one that will cover a lot more of the chapter, but it's mostly going to go through some concepts in how these problems work, and then we will be seeing a full example problems as separate videos. So I'll see you next time.